Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody uh, tuning in at home. My name is Alex Schumann, member number 1210, uh, past president of the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. I'm honored to have here again tonight Wayne White, who I've spoken with before about his many adventures. Uh, but he's here tonight to speak with us specifically uh, about his recent book that has just come out, Cold, uh, telling the story of his adventures as, uh, that he accrued uh, over three winters spent as station chief at the South Pole uh, station. So, Wayne, thank you for coming back and, and sharing your stories with us. Well, Alec, it's great to be here. I'm Wayne White, member number 1194, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I love this club. I love the members and the, and the, the guests that the members bring. Uh, when I first came here, before my first deployment to the South Pole, I felt immediately at home um, walking in this place because it looked a lot like the inside of my house. So uh, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, <laughs> her, her decorating ideas are slightly different. But nonetheless, uh, so it's really great to be here tonight, and I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, just so you kind of know what I plan on doing, I've given several presentations on the South Pole, and so I figure some of the members have seen a number of the slides. I wanted to change things up a little bit tonight, and I wanted it to be more oriented toward the book, because there's some things in the book that weren't necessarily, um, that weren't necessarily things that I discussed when I was uh, between deployments, uh, when I did other presentations that I, that I would like to discuss. Um, and with that, yeah, and let, let me just say, it's, it's a fantastic book, Wayne. Obviously, we've spoken about your adventures here before, and I encourage anybody uh, who's interested to go back and, and look at the past talks that you've given, uh, which touches on a lot of the adventures that you've had. Uh, but the book is great. It, you know, again, touches on so many different aspects of uh, both adventure and, you know, the scientific research that happens down there and, and all the different components that, you know, come into play for living in such a hostile environment. So I encourage anybody, you know, to pick up the book. I think, Wayne, you said you might be signing books tonight, potentially, yeah. if anybody has copies? Yeah. I've signed a few already, but if there's people here who, who uh, have copies I haven't signed yet, uh, please let me do that, and let me say thank you to anybody who has bought my book. I, 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 I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about writing a book. Everybody thinks they can write a book. Everybody thinks they're interesting and they can write a book. And what you find out is most people, you know, we're not always that interesting. Um, and what I mean by that is this is actually my second book. I wrote another book in between my first and second deployments at the South Pole uh, called Contractor. And I thought Contractor is about the nearly 20 plus years I worked around the world in very remote sites uh, prior to the South Pole. Uh, and then through the two wars in Iraq and then Afghanistan. And it's, uh, that book has a lot of very interesting information in there and things that most people don't do. So what do you do when you write a book? There's a couple routes you can go. You can self-publish. Um, I didn't want to do that. Nothing against people that self-publish. But my feeling was I wanted it to be good enough to where I would get a real agent and then get a real publisher to publish my book. And there's a good business case to be made for self-publishing. There's people that do it, and, and I'm not talking that down. It just wasn't the route I wanted to go. It's not easy to get a literary agent, and it's not easy to get then, then to find a publisher. And for people that don't know, that really, I'm sure I've got a few authors in the group, um, there's some great resources on the internet about writing a book and what you need to do to even attract an agent, which you're going to have to do with, for traditional publishing. And this is, I think it comes down to three things that, that will, will help you obtain an agent. The first is you're a celebrity. If you're a celebrity, you can write any, about anything and someone's going to buy it because you're a celebrity. Two, you're a great writer. You know, you're Ernest Hemingway. You're uh, uh, one of these other you know, famous, uh, um, um, you're, you're, you're just a fantastic writer. Or three, you have a great story. And what I thought was, I'm not the top two, but I had what I thought was a pretty good story. And what I decided to do once I was getting with my contractor book, floating that out there and getting kind of lukewarm, get a few agents that say, yeah, it's kind of interesting, but not really what I do. So I stopped and I shelved it because I, I knew that that experience at the South Pole, would, most people would find that more interesting. So I then um, shelved contractor and started cold um, while I was at the South Pole. And um, I'm glad I did that, and, I, and, I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really happy with the product, the literary agent I have, Lisa, I think it's just wonderful. Potomac Books published it. Potomac Books is actually uh, uh, owned by the University of Nebraska Press, and they have about five other book, other book companies that they, that they um, own, and um, just been the best experience so far. But 
to talk a little bit about, about this book and what I'm going to do tonight. I've changed the program to make it a little shorter. I usually have a lot of slides, and I think it goes a little long. And all those people interested, it is a Thursday night in Los Angeles. And, uh, and so I've changed it to make fewer slides and more oriented toward the book than what I did in the past with things like the, with the uh, um, tours of the station and things like that. I've tried to focus more on the book. So some of you folks, you know, have been here and sat through the presentations. You won't be watching the same thing over and over. When I wrote this book, one thing I wanted to do was to be honest. I wanted to be honest. And one thing that scared me right away in writing the book was there's a natural tendency, you read about it, to write yourself the hero in your own book. And I did not want to do that. Um, so anyways, a very important thing happened to me after I, Potomac Books picked it up. After we'd come to terms, about a month or so later, I got this page and a half from Potomac Books, from their editor. His name is Tom. And he said, uh, Wayne, here's some thoughts on your book. Just some thoughts from somebody. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change anything. But just read it. See what you think. And I looked at this page and a half of just comments about things in the book. Obviously, the person in the book uh, had had experience in the United States on Arctic program. I could tell by the way it was written um, that they had experience. And so I looked at that. And I went to England at that time, as a matter of fact, because I was part of this wonderful thing, the Request uh, group, where a bunch of young people um, recreated uh, Ernest Shackleton's voyage in the quest that he died on in the 1920s. And I was uh, part of that program. And I took it to the hotel with me. And I, for a week, I didn't hardly come out of that room. I stayed in there and did some, did some changes to the book. And while I didn't, wasn't this page and a half, I didn't do a lot with that. But there was one that really caught me. And the guy said, guy or, or, or female, I don't know, and I'll never know, from what we read, we, we don't know you. We really don't know you. Um, and I saw that I was trying to kind of do it as a neutral third party, you know, stay out of it, so to speak. But then again, I'm the crew leader, and, and I do have a perspective. So at that point, I started adding some things to the book that were more personal. But then going back to that thing about writing yourself the hero in your novel, I did not want to do that. So I put some things in there that people will find interesting. It's not all uh, good things, um, but there's some things that, that have happened in my life that have made me what I am that at least will make, I thought people might find interesting or they'd find pathetic or they'd find whatever, I don't really care. But they, it would make them understand more where I'm coming from in the book, rather than simply it's just a, it's just a um, you know, my, my South Pole experience. They'd have to understand more about me to understand why I wrote and why I think the way I did. And, then, and that might make it more interesting for people. Um, with that, the last thing on the book, folks, one thing I've learned about writing a book is you could ask 100 people what they, uh, you know, about what they think of the book, and you're going to get 100 different answers. One person will say, you didn't even write enough about food. Another person will say, you wrote too much about food. This person will say, you wrote too much about yourself. This next person will say, you didn't write enough about yourself. And it goes back and forth like that. You can't please everybody. That's the thing. And in the end, I'm happy with this book. Um, I'm happy with, with and, and I'm looking forward to, to, to what people think. Okay. Well, if I could interject here yeah, for yeah. a second, Wayne. So I think what you're talking about does come through in the book, the idea of, of you know, the, the old soul adventurer, you know, and seeking out that old, you know, that old school truly, you know, going off the beaten path to those blank spots in the map and seeking what's there. And the challenges that come with trying to do that and live that kind of lifestyle in the modern age, mm -hmm. which is, is definitely different than it was during the golden age of exploration. And so to that point, if you wouldn't mind just expounding sure, on, on one yeah. small thing, you know, I made a couple notes as I was going through that, that stuck out, that stuck out to me. And I think, you know, Fittingly so, that definitely speak towards that spirit of adventure that, you know, I think hopefully a lot of members of this club understand, but, you know, maybe other people, you know, would appreciate hearing more about. And one of the initial lines that really stuck out was you talking about the cold and saying, um, uh, I would eventually love it. You said, I never liked the cold, but during my time at the South Pole, with much exposure to unimaginable cold, I would eventually love it. I would love it while still never liking it. And I think that's kind of an interesting reflection on an adventurer's psychology, if there ever was one, about you know, what, is, what does it entail to 
love something without liking it? And how does that relate to the adventures that, that we see? I'm glad you picked that out because that's, I like the way that sounded anyway. Um, and looking at it, it was like the word like is just too lukewarm. It's a little bit lukewarm. I don't like, for example, if it was 40 degrees outside and I walked out in a t-shirt, it'd be cold. It, it cold instinctively isn't a good thing. And I write about that. Cold is the human being, just as humans need warmth. But with unimaginable cold. That cover that you're looking at was taken at minus 104 Fahrenheit. I'd just come back from a seven mile walk. Uh, it was taken by Dr. Jeffrey Chen, one of our scientists after I'd come back. That's pretty much unimaginable cold. So, but that, when you read the book later, you'll see what that gave me facing that versus just cold weather. I wouldn't move to Minnesota, for example, because I enjoy cold weather. Yeah. Well, no, and I think that's, be, I mean, one thing I've heard a lot on different adventures is type two fun. Stuff that's not fun during, but afterwards you look back and it was a great time. Um, but I, I just thought, again, that that kind of stuck out to me as, as something unique about the experience uh, that I think so many people, when they think about travel, they're seeking out experiences that they'll not only love, but will like. And I remember also there's an excerpt from later in the book where you talk about uh, one particularly harsh night you were out there getting blasted in the face with wind and you just started laughing to yourself about how much fun you were having and how absurd that was. <laughs> just to kind of look at yourself in the third person about like what a ridiculous thing to, to be doing and to be enjoying in that moment just made you laugh to yourself. Yeah, I, uh, thanks for that. That was an interesting moment where I was laughing out loud outside. Someone would have thought I went insane if there would have been anybody out in that storm. But I was thinking to myself that this is crazy but I, you know, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't. Would rather do nothing else than be out here. This is, you know, where I was in life, and uh, yeah, and I loved it. So, okay, um, next. All right. Uh, th some of you have seen this before from my last presentation, but it's good. It's good that you that you all at least have some background on the South Pole. Uh, facts, so you'll, it'll make more sense, the book. And the first is the elevation. Most people don't know that the South Pole is at an elevation of 9,300 feet. It sits, uh, it's an ice cap, but it sits on old rock bed, you know, 9,300 feet below. And there's a physiological effect because of a, when low, with low atmospheric pressure that can raise um, it, the feeling to being over 12,000 feet. People that fly from the coast of McMurdo and hit 12,000 feet sometimes have a real hard time. And you'll have that mountain sickness and such. And how they have to be evacuated, they could die very serious. But that's important to know that that ice, that, that ice cap sits that high. Um, also, you need to know where the summer is at the South Pole. The summer season is short. Summer season is from November, uh, around November 1st. First flights come in usually a little earlier in October. But November 1st is... is considered the start of summer, and only goes up to February 15th. During that time, it's light 24 hours a day, and the temperature, to me, is relatively mild. Um, you can see that the, when, when I got there, it was about minus 58 at the very end of October, and it quickly, uh, the temperature rose, and the, the warmest it ever was while I was there was one, maybe it was December, January day, where it was actually plus nine plus nine, which would be considered really, really warm. That was like record warm. So that's the summer. The winter um, is much colder and goes from, uh, from February 15th all the way to about November, November 1st. Uh, temperatures are much colder. I think it says that the average is about minus 76, and it gets much colder than that. Uh, I'll explain how the sun works next. Okay, so this is kind of what's going on with the South Pole, people don't realize, as far as the darkness situation. For about half a year, it's light 24 hours a day, and then it starts getting dark. And when you see the blue and there's the blue shades, it starts getting dimmer and dimmer. When you're getting into this, the second and third shade of blue, it's getting pretty dim outside. And by the time it's black on there, it's dark. It's fully dark. So you're dealing with maybe about five months or approximately of, of, of pretty total darkness, Four and a half, five months right in there, depending um, where it's dark and it's cold. Next. All right, it's the book. Uh, I wrote a book. And uh, I was very influenced uh, when I was out the at Ascension Island prior to my departure reading Moby Dick. Um, Moby Dick about this isolated sea captain. And... Um, I really enjoyed the book, although I do think that that wonderful writer 
um, Melville, who wrote it, was paid by the word. I mean, it was, the, I, <laughs> I, I, I struggled through it, and I've read other Melville work that wasn't like that, but he got awfully flowery in Moby Dick. But I like this structure, and if you see my structure, where I go through the different things, um, the different aspects that I wanted to cover. Interestingly enough, when I first did this, and I was going through the editing process, there were 12 chapters, and I looked at it, and because I liked the number 13, I actually cut a chapter, you know, divided it in half and made 13 because it's a good number for me. So it was that easy. You're the author. You can do what you want. So I have 13 chapters. But um, this, uh, uh, again, I tried to be honest with this. I wanted to be, uh, and not too much self-aggrandizement, although it'll, it'll probably come through. And um, I hit the main points of the experience there, I believe. Next. Okay. The cruise. I had three South Pole winter crews. Now, two, for two of those crews, I was there an entire year because I was there with them for this, the summer and then also the winter. See, as the winter manager, you are uh, actually you report to the Denver office sometime in the spring, and then you'll be there from it could be you know it could be April, May, and then all the way through October. You're recruiting crew members, you're putting them through training, you're doing testing, you're doing interviews and all that. So, as the winter manager, you're responsible to be in Denver doing all those things. And then you deploy for training, which I'll show come October. I had three crews, so I did three winters at the South Pole. So I'll explain. OK. Um, and it's dark there. This. <laughs> OK. Getting there. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these things, but I'm just going to say that one thing I enjoy, I'm, 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 and I'm, I'm glad. I know some people really liked it, the process to what we used to, to um, to select people. It's a fascinating process to sit in an interview with someone. And I have, see, I already had, I, I, in this presentation, I don't go through too much of my experience, but I've worked all over the world in remote sites. I've been, I've spent, I was gone most of 20 years at, to places uh, like, uh, let's see, started off with Midway Toll, then from there up to Shimia Island, Alaska, if you know where that is. I spent four years on the end of the Aleutian chain. Uh, from there, I went to Iraq. And then from Iraq, I went to Wake Island. I spent four years on a Wake Island, a tiny little spot in the Pacific Ocean, four years. Um, then from Wake Island, I went to uh, Afghanistan. From Afghanistan, oh, I left out Kuwait. Maybe I was in Kuwait for a while. Then Saudi Arabia. Then from Saudi Arabia to Ascension Island, South Atlantic. And that was prior to the, to the that was almost 20 years or more of working around the world as a leader, in most of the places as a leader and in these remote sites. So I'd seen a lot about how people, how people can be in isolation and some real horror stories because we hire over the phone at those places. And the, um, you don't do face-to-face -face interviews for most of those. It'd just be prohibitively expensive. My government contract, you don't have much money. So, but the difference is on, the, on those places, you can, you can terminate employment with people. So you get them out there, which I got stories I could tell you about what happened to people. People who got to the island and got drunk the first night and went crazy, and they're on the next plane out. You, you, you have those. You know, one guy on Diego Garcia was lost for three days. They thought he drowned. They were looking for him in a lagoon, and they found him drunk in a bus, bus bench place on the island. Um, stories and stories about mayhem that had occurred. So what I did know was when I'm doing the interviewing process, which I'm just part of a panel as the winter site manager, which was wonderful because I had these other people with experience on the panel. We're talking to people and realizing that that nice looking fellow with a tie across the table is going to say goddamn anything to go to the South Pole. He's going to say anything to go to the South Pole. He's going to be the most polite, uh, for the most part, um, very polite, you know, ingratiating and all that stuff if they really want to go. I knew that. Uh, I write in the book about some people who, who, <laughs> who are different. And we had one guy that I didn't put in the book because I didn't hear it. And I didn't want to put anything in the book just because someone else had heard it. But there was a guy we were interviewing, and he was already coming across very, very strangely. And he had this funny black goatee, and he was kind of rubbing it through the entire interview. And my, uh, when we were getting up, and I was going to take the guy back to the, the room after the interview, um, when I came back to the room, I, my boss said, you know, I'd taken the dude out, taken him out. And my boss said, Wayne, you know what that guy said? He said he was going to kill all of us if we didn't hire him. Oh. That was a joke. It was a joke. But still, you know, the problem is, <laughs> so, so I said, it's a joke. OK, is it a joke? I don't know. But anyway, the point is, is that you'd get some characters during those interviews. And uh, 
I really enjoyed them. I didn't enjoy the first year, and I, and I write about well, that. Before you, yeah, go in ahead. In terms of the recruiting process, yeah, there's yeah. a section of the book where you talk about that you would sneak onto the like applicant bus. Well, yeah, right on right. their way over to the interview mm -hmm. before they had met you or knew who you were. Yeah, and just kind of feel everybody out. Oh, it was fun. I I, I have a section that I write about. I, at, in that time, that first year, I stayed in the same hotel. We all stayed in the same. That it was different with the hotels, but the applicants would fly. They'd meet in this hotel and uh, groups of. You know, maybe six or eight at a time would stay in this hotel. And then they'd meet at a certain point in time and take the bus to, to get their interviews and go through this processing. And I would just like to go out there and be with them and listen to them. And you'd see, you'd hear stuff like, oh, really? Really? Because there'd usually be one or two who had been to at least McMurdo during the summer. And they're telling this audience of, starstruck people all about what it was going to be like and some bullshit that seemed these guys were coming up with I'm like you know listening to it and then about the time we'd pull into the we'd pull into the uh, the lot there for the our, for our office I'd say I'm Wayne White I'll be interviewing you and the groans from the van were interesting uh, but better than what I did there were former managers that used to sit with them at that they had a, a wine a drinking thing the night before there was free wine and beer and a little food and all this stuff and this, they would sit with them and several people ended their antarctic careers that night before yeah. they even interviewed you off from the wine and cheese oh and once they've got a few glasses of wine they start to loosen them. up a little bit yeah there were some stories and i didn't see that my i yeah. never went to those things did it that with them i would just listen to them you know the mornings of and such anyway the process to get to the south pole to be part of a winner over crew it's a really rigorous process to get the, the person that's right and so just going through that, um, I, I, I put a lot in the book about that, which some won't find interesting, but I think most will. And I, I tried to write the book, too, so it wasn't just for people that are in the U.S. Antarctic program. But quite frankly, I've had more than one person say that anybody that wants to be in the U.S. Antarctic program should read the book, because I talk a lot about that process, getting through that, what it's all about, the station and such. And it might, it's probably be an eye-opener. Next, please. All right. Uh, quickly for, for that... Um, that's my organization chart, and uh, I'm, I, you can't really see it that, that well anyway, but it's just to show the positions. And in the book, uh, Melville did that with Moby Dick. He went through each of the crew members, and I did sort of the same thing where I went through basically what you've got. But in a regular South Pole winter crew, you've got 42 crew members. One year we had 46. Actually, I was wrong in the book. It was 45 because we didn't hire one position. The point I'm making is generally it's 42 if you have everybody. You'll have eight scientists. You'll have a machinist that does nothing but, you know, hi-fi machining, which I'll talk about. And then you will have your IT people, your vehicle maintenance people, your food service people, your, um, um, your uh, safety person, your, your, your maintenance type personnel, uh, all support type people that you would need to keep this station operational and warm through an Antarctic winter because no one's coming. So those 42 people have to be highly skilled people that can not only be the best in the craft, but they can get along with other people. Next, please. Okay, you deploy. You deploy to the, oh, okay, this is the team building. Now, we actually had a psychological testing. I talk about that in the book. The psychological testing used to use the MMPI, Minnesota Multi-Personality Test, along with a couple other psychological tests. Asking people how they feel about their moms. Yeah. And stuff. yeah. You'd ask them if they're, if they're about their shit, things like that. So, you know, because if they're real preoccupied with that, then there's usually other issues. But the thing is, <laughs> that's what we found out. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, there's some interesting questions in there. A lot of them are, you know, there was one, and I mentioned this, there was, you don't know sometimes, and there was a question in there that said, I'd like to go to a party. And I was like, I really don't like to go to a party. But I said I'd like to go to a party because I didn't want to appear antisocial. Now, they're looking, you know, it's hard to say which way they're going. Are they looking for the introvert? Are they looking for the, you know, I don't know. But I know this, I know that the test was taking out, we were losing mechanics more than, way too many mechanics that were, had already been in the program, were at McMurdo, were known quantities, and they would fail our psychological testing. And the best I could come up with was that, was that a mechanic is a real solo flyer. A mechanic thinks they're the best mechanic. A mechanic, you know, does, you know, is just a different kind of breed. So we were losing a lot of mechanics, and so we actually dumped the test uh, and then did other things. And one of the things, the slide here is the team building, where you get everybody together, you run them through team building with Sean. Um, 
uh, who was our team building um, coach who ran a business, Sean Dunning. And this isn't trust falls and silly things and playing with beach balls and stuff. It's doing some, some interesting exercises to show that you, that you can work in a group and solve problems. And boy, I really watched these things closely. Uh, one other thing about the interview I want to mention. The first year doing the interviews, I didn't like because I'm sitting there and I'd have a candidate and the candidate would say, you know, I've never been there before. He's talking to all these Antarcticans that are interviewing him. There's five of them sitting there and he says, God, what does my minus 100 feel like? I didn't know. Never been in it. So I hated it. I was uncomfortable because I'm going down for the first time too. I had many years of experience working around the world, but it's not the same. And I was so happy the second year when I had had all that experience. Okay, so you do team building. Next, you go through fire training at, the, at a, a place in Aurora. And it's a really good, it's a one-week school, and that's it. Now, it's for fire training to learn how to just basically put out a fire because you're the 911 while you're at the pole, especially in the winter. In the summer, there's an ARF group for the aircraft that are there. They're hi-fi, real deal, no shit firemen. Uh, but uh, for us, we're this, you know, volunteer group that have been trained for it by a week in Denver, and that's what we do. And, um, and did, did you say it. in the book that people had to pick between being basically EMTs yeah. Yeah. or fire? Yeah, they picked to a point, and then I kind of helped sometimes too. Uh, I wanted many more people on fire than on, on for the medical because the medical we could train down there, but fire you can't train down there. So it was better to put as many people through fire school as possible. But you either went through fire or a couple of days of medical. You, we did give them a choice up to a point. Really looking for someone who had fire experience prior. Next. You deploy. That's at uh, that's that's taken at uh, at um, Christchurch at the deployment center. Next, C-17 from Christchurch, New Zealand. You fly from there to McMurdo Station, Antarctica. Next, if you haven't been inside a C-17, it's a big aircraft. I, I think they're just wonderful. They also fly 130s. I've done it both ways, but I much prefer the C-17 as a real toilet rather than that little tube. That little tube thing from the, <laughs> and the curtain with the bucket, and that's real nice. Okay, next. <laughs> and you get to McMurdo, and you land on ice. You're landing on ice for the C-17. Unbelievable. Next. Okay, a couple of things at McMurdo. You've got Scott's Hut from 1903. Next. And you've got Vincent's Cross. Wayne, do you want to give a little context for who Captain yeah, Scott yeah. was? For people well, very, know. very important, because um, I, I don't get into a lot, but it does get into it. Yeah, he's mentioned quite a bit in the book. There was a great race to the South Pole that occurred in the early 1900s. Um, captain Robert Falcon Scott, a British uh, uh, Navy captain, uh, made an attempt. Actually, it wasn't much of an attempt. Went down there first with his discovery expedition of 1903 through 1905 or something like that, around that time frame. And they did all kinds of Antarctic stuff, but they didn't, they didn't go to the South Pole. They made far the south, but they were nowhere near the South Pole. He came back later. Um, along with other famous people that you've all heard of, Ernest Shackleton for the Nimrod expedition of around 1907, who made it within 98 miles of the South Pole and then turned around. Uh, Roel Amundsen, the great Norwegian, first to the South Pole and a, quite a hero of mine. That guy was tough, and I discussed a little bit about how he did what he did, what he had to do, eating his dogs to do it. And then uh, Robert Falcon Scott, who went back for his, um, his last expedition uh, and died down there and made it to the pole and then died on the way back. So well, these and the tragedy of Scott was that he got down there. Yeah. He was racing Amundsen, got down there a week or two. It was about a month. Did, and found the Norwegian flag planted <laughs> there. <laughs> the tent was there. And, and a nice note. A nice I note think, that he knew should that, deliver. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, unfortunately <laughs> perished on the way back. And yeah. his, his hut, yeah. his base, from what I've heard, is, is like a time machine. It's yeah. It's been frozen in time. This hut there, the Discovery Hut, and then also his hut over there at, at Point Evans, is, um, is another famous, uh, they're Antarctic trust sites now, I think. They, they still got old cans in there from the, from the expedition, and it's uh, quite amazing that they're still, but these were my heroes. These are the people that I really respected. This is and my big reason for wanting to go. Actually, let me back up a little bit. When I, because this is important, I am speaking next month at the Mars Convention in Tempe, Arizona. Why is that? Well, my topic is the South Pole and Mars, because there is, there's some things, similarities and things for Mar Mars missions. When I, was first, when I was first interviewed, when my f boss asked me, why do you want to do this? My answer was, because I can't go to Mars. 
So I thought this would be the next best thing. Later, we had some NASA people at the South Pole that visited once, and my boss went and got me. Come over here, Wayne. Tell these guys why you're here. I can't go to Mars. I'm big in the Mars. That's, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. Next, please. That's Vincent's cross. He died, I think, in 1903. 1903, 1905, right around that period. Fell off, swept away in a storm, and died. Never was found. Now, the reason I show these slides is because I write in my book, I was no fan of McMurdo, and I'm going to have people watching this. They're all McMurdo people. They're going to go, oh my God, travesty, travesty, he doesn't like McMurdo. Um, I didn't initially care for it, and my trips through were as brief as I could make them to get to the South Pole. I, uh, McMurdo has a different atmosphere. There's kind of a party thing. There's a, there's a different kind of community there. Um, they have a thing called ice stock, and they play you know, music, and everybody gets drunk and does things, and a couple people get fired. And, um, and they have a lot of things that I thought were a bit silly. Um, but in time, I softened, and later in the book, I write what I think about McMurdo. It's a beautiful place. It's different. But it wasn't for me. That's not me. I was much more serious about it. And I just getting through McMurdo and getting, getting back out to pole or getting to Christchurch, either way, was the best thing. Although McMurdo had one thing that I loved, absolutely loved. They had a soft serve ice cream machine. <laughs> and after a year at the South Pole, and then it had these what do they call M&Ms, like you could dump these M&Ms in it. <laughs> Once I went through there, and for three days, I think I ate nothing but that soft serve ice cream with those M&Ms. Yeah, what was the weather like then? Negative 60, negative 50? Oh, no, it was warm. It was like, you know, it was above zero. I mean, so it felt, <laughs> you could, the t-shirt weather, really. Next, please. All right, you arrive at the South Pole. You're now at 9,300 feet. Next. There you are. So, no place on Earth can have all those Norths. Um, in my book, I talk about the summers, and I'm, I'm not kind in a lot of ways. About the summers at the South Pole, I didn't, I didn't care for so much. Some of the winter crew deploys right away, with, with, right away um, it, during the summer and spends the entire three months in the summer there and then goes on to winter. Some of the winter crew comes in later, toward the, more toward the end, like in January. Then the rest come in, and then they fill out your full crew for that last day. Um, summers that... Pole Station had, Almonds and Scott South Pole Station has room for 150 people, and it's full, and people are in there doing whatever they do, and it, to me, I, I, you know, it just, it, it's got a lot of social things going on, and s some things happen, and I write about a few wild occurrences that happen in my book, but I wasn't a fan of the summers, and I was really happy when winter started, but still, a number of things do happen in summer. They're important. Next. This is the elevated station, and I mentioned there's actually three stations. The first was Old Pole. It occurred in 1957, the end of 1956 through 1957, and it lasted for so many years until they built the iconic dome station. Some of you have seen pictures of the dome. Um, that, that was removed you know, over a decade ago. Both the Old Pole and both the dome are gone, and now this is the Amundsen Scott elevated station. And I'm not, I don't do a tour of this because I'm trying to, gonna try to hurry. But it's around 50,000 square feet. It has a gym. It has a weight room. It has a sauna. has room for 150 people, single rooms. And the only thing I'll show is my room because, I just again, I want to shorten this. But it's, I think it's a beautiful thing. That's the windward side. That's the side the wind blows. It's made to face into the wind. The wind blows below it uh, and, 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 and uh, keeps it keeps it cl uh, clear, free of ice. The other important thing is a station can be raised because the other stations kind of sunk through around 12 inches or so of new ice each year. The Amundsen Scott South Pole Station has these giant pillars, and they can be, they're not raised like you push a button and it raises. You've got to do a construction thing and put these pieces in, but you can raise the station. So it's, it's pretty cool. Next, please. And that just shows you kind of where the station is and shows some distances. Uh, the, you can see where the Amundsen Scott Station is, which you just saw the picture, and then you'll see to the north is where the satellites are. That's about 0.7 miles, 0.7 miles. Then you'll see the science projects, and I discuss them, not in a lot of detail in the book, and I don't have much tonight on them, but the Arrow, which is run by the NOAA organization, um, and the MAPO, the Marvin Pomerantz Observatory, the South Pole Telescope, and the ICL. ICL being a very fascinating thing with a cubic kilometer of ice with these detectors in it that are neutrino detectors. That's the main science that occurs at the South Pole, but there's a lot more. Those are the major projects, though. D did you have any say over those science crews that were staffed by outside Interestingly enough, or? no, although we could have, we could have, um, when they were there in the summer, if there was an issue, 
we could have done something with that. I would have to say that because we didn't interview the science, they were done. They were interviewed by their their perspective. Like it was usually a university or yeah. something. But but Alex, strangely enough, we never really had issues. Now some winners they did. My winners, I was fortunate that we might have had a person or two that was a little unusual. But as a scientist, they were supposed to be they were supposed to be working with everybody else and doing what they do. Some crews were closer. My first two crews maybe were a little closer with the science and the rest of the crew. Third year was a little bit different. But um, but they were. Um, uh, you know, these people, when we, when I, and I mentioned it in the book, when I use scientists, some had PhDs, but they're also people with bachelor's degrees. It just depended. They're basically caretakers. They're not out there doing research. They're making sure the telescopes work and troubleshooters should the thing break down or something because back at the universities where all the data is coming, that's where all the analysis is. But a superb group of people, and I think the universities did a superb job of vetting these folks. because We just didn't have problems with them. But I think that's an interesting point to kind of go into, and not to get ahead of us in case you're yeah. going to touch on it later, but you, know, you made the point that you in this leadership role, it was kind of unique and that you didn't have any direct reports. Yeah. That you were this kind of person at the center who was responsible for everything, but didn't necessarily have... Yeah that real power or authority that most people would associate with being a boss or being a yeah. manager, or especially you mentioned a lot, kind of the, the parallels to, you know, being a military outfit. Absolutely. That there are a lot of former military that come down there and, and yeah. approach it like that. And sometimes, you know, run up against it because they come and think that they can order people around and tell people what to do and when to do it. And really they have no authority to do any of that. That's right. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up. And this is just as good a time as any, because I make a major point in the book and some people won't understand why I hit it so hard. They won't, they probably won't get that. But as this, as a civilian contractor in charge of all these people who work for various companies and various educational institutions, the only thing you really have is the power of yourself, your own being, uh, you know, your own methods of persuasion to, to influence these people. You're basically influencing them. You're, you, you can direct them all you want, but in the end they could say no, they could, you know, and it has happened. And I, I knew the history of the South Pole, and also saw what could happen out on islands I'd worked on, however I had the ability to send them home. Here I didn't. So I, what I did was, and it's a big deal in the book, and people will either understand it or they won't, I had a gulf between myself and my crews. It was always there. I didn't drink with them. I didn't, I socialized as far as I went to social events, but I kept a distance. As a military officer, uh, there was a phrase, there's a phrase, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. And it, unfortunately, it's kind of can be true. Um, with smart people, it shouldn't be true, but it can be true. I didn't want them to ever be very familiar with me. So I kept that gulf. I did it on purpose. I didn't go into it in the book. I didn't want to embarrass anybody. There's a, probably a few embarrassing things in there, but I tried to be careful with that. But there have been some winter managers in the past that had a real hard winter. And they crossed that line, and they did things, and there was a history of some real problems that have occurred. So I knew I would keep, I would keep that goal. I know I let them know what I thought they needed to know about me, and I got great respect from the crews, and I always appreciated that. But I wouldn't have if I'd been old Wayne sitting in the room drunk with them and doing, you know, doing, you know, participating in certain things. So I, I, I kept that goal. But again. You wouldn't really understand that unless you knew how bad some of those years were with leaders that just weren't leaders. And I, I didn't, again, want to go through. There's some terrible stories there uh, with what's happened with some of those folks that um, weren't leaders, didn't know how to lead, and then ended up being having a winter where the Denver office basically just told them what to do. Um, one guy, and he was a good guy, at one point had a bit of a, there was a bit of a minor insurrection. And uh, he... Uh, he asked his boss in Denver to call down to the station and tell everyone at the station that he was in charge. Well, if you got to do that. <laughs> now, my boss, if it told me that story back at the station, knew enough that that would not have been a good idea. If you have to call to tell everybody that this guy really is in charge, you, you got a problem. So he worked through some other things and got to the winner. And this was a really good guy, too, who actually had been a, a military officer. Uh, but there's other stories of just where people crossed lines, did things they shouldn't have done, and they lost the respect to the crew, and it made for a lonely winter. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's a big point in the book, but something where I was kind of cryptic because I didn't want to embarrass people too much with that. Do you, do you touch a little bit later in your talk about some of the interferences by the Denver office? I'll go into that a little bit, it, it, and it, uh, about how, what happens with, it, with them, because it, it was a little unique, particularly that third year. Yeah. Next. 
Summer, what do they do? A lot of ice. A lot of ice to clean up. The winter storms have made the, uh, the place a mess. Next. Dig out things. A lot of digging. Next. Construction. That's the discus, the new discus uh, satellite that, the, that they're putting in out there. Next. That's my room. And it's the only pictures really of the station I show inside. I, I removed all the other photos. It just goes into too long. But I did want to show you the room. I mentioned it in the book. That's a shop made ladder that somebody made that I thought was beautiful. And I had my bed elevated. Most weren't, most are low. But I, it was, I found it that way when I moved in. And I really enjoyed it because I had the room underneath. Next. And I would store my boots and things underneath. Next. And I wanted to point this out. Another thing that should be noted Antarctica is the highest, driest, Let's see, coldest or windiest, whatever, place on the planet. Uh, it's very dry. It's classified as a desert. So many of us had humidifiers in our rooms. I don't think my humidifier really did much, but I liked the white noise. I, liked, I, I enjoyed having just the noise. Next. I was outside a lot. I started right away. And I, I mentioned in the book, because people have been down there in the summer, and they come back, and everybody oohs and ahs. Oh, I've been to Antarctica. Oh, I went to the South Pole, or I went to you know, McMurdo, or I was on a cruise ship, and they let us off on this. And everybody's thinking, oh my god, you froze to death. You were facing peril at every moment. Mm -hmm. I'm running there. I thought the South Pole in the summertime wearing sweatpants. Um, that was a couple layers. I'm wearing several layers. But, but I was outside every day there. Next. I like that photo. I was outside running, and someone, one of our firefighters took that. I didn't know. He showed me later while I was out running in the summer. Next. There's events that occur. Events occur, in the, it, it, and I write about this. This is the Marine Corps birthday. I'm a Marine, and um, if there's other Marines on station on November 10th, on November 10th, you uh, um, celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. Any Marines in the room? Damn it. Probably some sailors? Yeah. <laughs> oh, OK. All right. Yeah, you yeah, those guys. But you know, <laughs> no, my dad was a sailor. I was born in the Bethesda Naval Hospital. I can't say anything about sailors. Um, Anyways, uh, you celebrate the Marine Corps birthday on November 10th. Next. Next day is Veterans Day. And I wrote in my book about that one particular Veterans Day. And it, some people might not understand why I write what I write about. It, was, it got marred a little bit by someone that wanted to work her federal branch of the, of the, of the government into the Veterans Day celebration. And um, I wasn't having it. Veterans Day is for veterans, military veterans. Now. We've got a couple little branches that are pushing into this veteran status thing. To me, you're a veteran. You're a veteran of the military, the Department of Defense. So I write about that. But the bigger thing is I'm meeting too many Marines these days that spent two weeks in boot camp. And oh, they had to go home for personal reasons or whatever the heck. It's all part of you know, our kind of watered down society. Uh, Marines that aren't really Marines, you know, people that claim they did this or did that. And I, I hate that stuff. I really do. Um, Veterans Day is for me. For me, is for U.S. military veterans. Next, this is important. This is January 1st, big event. That's placing the pole marker at 90 degrees south. Every year, and I'll show you later how this works. There's a pole marker that's made, and the ice is moving. It moves at 33 feet per year. So as the ice moves, your 90 degrees south pole marker has to be moved 33 feet, and you know. So you have to. So you, you put the new one in. On January 1st, of this is 2017, I put the pole marker in at 90 degrees south that was for the, that the 2016 crew had made during their winter. And I'll discuss how that works. It's quite an honor to do that. And I, I, it's really cool. Uh, my boss from Denver would come out. He'd unveil it. The crowd would ooh and ah. And they'd pass it around, all the people. And I tried to start a tradition that the incoming winter manager planted it. They'd probably do whatever they've done. Who knows if they, that ever stuck. But it was important because then you could honor the crew, that, the, the crew that you had replaced that were there now. That was their marker from 2016. Rather than just someone that blew in off the last aircraft, happens to be standing there, and they stick it in the, in the ice. Big day. Next. Uh, that is the um, um, back up, please, to the flag. Yeah, that's uh, uh, January 17th, I think it is, uh, the day, uh, 17th or 14th, whenever, the day Robert Falcon Scott uh, arrived at the South Pole. And as Alex said, when he arrived at the South Pole, imagine this, folks, imagine he shows up, his men are tired, they're starving, they've slogged for 
over 800 miles, mostly manhandling the, the gear, the materials, their food. They get there, what do they find? The Norwegian tent, Norwegian dog tracks are everywhere, Norwegian dog shits everywhere, and there's a nice letter for Scott to take back and deliver to the king of Norway if, if, if something would have happened to him, Roll Amundsen. It was a way to, to, uh, um, to show that he had been to the South Pole first. And when Scott was found dead in his tent, he had those letters, and he would have done that. As a gentleman at the time, he wouldn't have just thrown it in the trash and said, okay, don't tell anybody the Norwegians are here first. Um, anyways, big day. Next, please. This is the spot group. These people actually drive up South Pole Overland Traverse. They drive from McMurdo, kind of a circuitous route, sort of around the, these Transantarctic mountains. It's much longer than the 800 miles straight. I think it's 1,300 miles or something, the way they take. And end up going up uh, uh, one of the, uh, I forgot the name of the glacier, they go up there. Um, but they make this route several times during the summer. It's very, very interesting. Um, in my book, I, I write about tourists, and I, I'm a little disparaging about tourists. I'm not so bad on the, the cruise ship folks. I, I get it. Cruise ships would be fun. I wouldn't mind doing that myself. Um, but you do have people that fly in. I know we've got people who have done it here, and not to disparage anybody's experience, but the last I saw, there was a group that came in. It was $96,000 to go to the South Pole and take your hero shot. And um, if you got that kind of money, great. But uh, um, not my thing. But you've also got these days, and I do make a point of it in the book, and this is, um, we'll see how, how that goes. You've got people that, I mentioned something about uh, skiing, motorcycle, been done, uh, pogo sticks at some point in the future. Everybody's trying to claim some silly first. I can't stand that stuff. This is me personally. You guys can disagree. I can't stand all the silly firsts that occur. Everybody wants to be the first something of something to do this and that. Big goddamn deal. You know, I mean, it, 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 there was a, there's a number of these things. I take nothing away from the athleticism to someone getting to the South Pole, however mechanism they do. But uh, the Instagram, the me, 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 look at me stuff, I can't stand it personally. Again, I'm speaking for myself. And there's a lot of that occurring. It's a damn circus at times there. And it's just not my thing. Um, if I could interject yeah. again just on that point, because, again, I think it is interesting. I think it's something that... Uh, people who are adventurers at heart struggle with is, you know, that there is obviously the, the ego attached to it. There is the me, me, me dynamic. But I think there is also to some degree, you know, a sincere desire yeah. to explore something, you know, that no one's ever done before. And those opportunities are becoming fewer yeah. and farther between. And one line that you, you know, wrote here that I thought was interesting, he said, uh, to me, suffering can be noble and readily worth it if it leads to real achievement not simply a certificate or patch. Uh, and prior to that, oh, here, this is the line that I liked. It said, uh, I have a fondness for harsh conditions, but not for those that are contrived. Yeah. And I think one thing that I, I've reflected on and thought about, and wonder if you have any insights or thoughts about it, is at, at some point it feels like every amount of suffering is going to be contrived. That seems to be the general goal of society at large these days, is that, you know, to root out suffering wherever you can find it. And for people who have an adventurous spirit and would like to seek out meaningful suffering, you know, what, what are we to do with a world that actively seeks to make all suffering a contrivance? Yeah, and that's a good one. And that's something that I'm a, you know, still thinking about. See, the days are done. Exploration on this planet, the real stuff besides, we've got stuff in the ocean, of course. There's caves, there's things we can do. But Balboa is not going to peer around a rock and spot the Pacific Ocean. Burton and Speak are not going to go look for the source of the Nile. Um, Hillary's not going to go, you know, do Everest again and all that. Now it's the tour route up and all. But um, those things are out of our lives now. And so people, and I do admire the, the desire to do more. I really do. It's just, why does it have to be on Instagram and TV and Facebook and me, me, look at me, and that's really what's happening. Um, I, I, that, and that's why I'm so big on the Mars thing. I say, let's, 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 let's go to the next level and do some real exploring, not all these rehashes of, of things. And I write about that with the guys that ski to the South Pole. They were the first to do this or that, and then they always say, they like to say, for the reason for, you know, they're requesting funding a lot of times, and it's, it's, uh, it's to raise awareness about Antarctica, really? You think you need to do that? No, it's to get to somebody to pay for your little adventure. Um, Antarctica is a fragile place. 
and we shouldn't be running trucks and things and aircraft that we don't need to run, but we do. Uh, but, but back to that, you know, it's interesting what people too think about adventure. When we were doing returning from adventure, I just returned from seven months at Kwajalein. I was in charge of the boats and the divers there. I didn't answer returning from adventure because I didn't think it was very adventurous. Some people, that might be the most adventurous thing in their lives. But to me, it, was, it, was, it wasn't. And um, so my view is different. And I don't want to be harsh on people that want to do things and are still trying to do things. I really don't. I, I, I don't want to turn people off and, and you know, rub the great history because I'm a, I'm a fan of history. And in my house, and I, I don't show it in this particular slideshow, I own a number of things that, that uh, I brought at the last meeting, a ring Henry Morton Stanley wore, uh, his personal ring on a number of things that came from his house in Furs Hill. I have a piece of wood that was a part of the, that was a cross section of the branch that they carried David Livingston's body across Africa with. I have some things in there that are world class pieces. That's around me. That's around me every day. My standard is higher than the latest little ski trip, me, me, look at me, from the guy that, you know, is doing the same thing that 100 people have done, but he's the first Croatian something, whatever the hell, there's always an angle these days. Uh, <laughs> You know, it just turns me off. And again, you guys, whatever, whatever, audience out there, that's me. And, you know, you just, weird dude, okay. But, um, but I, still, I still admire the, the, you know, the desire to push that people have. And it's harder and harder to do that in a meaningful way. Um, I had some tough trips, and I write about it, a couple of those things in that book, I, 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 a couple of tough trips. One trip I took years ago that I never forgot, and it's kind of in there, but it's enough for another reason, was New Guinea. Uh, I, I always wanted it. My big thing in life as a young man was going to New Guinea. And, and the first time I went to Papua New Guinea years ago, it was 1980s, 1980, 1981 it was. Anyway... I hiked the Kokoda track back then by myself. And that was a big deal at the time because the track was overgrown. There were problems and things and guy had just been killed and there's some occurrences. But I did it by myself, knowing what I knew. Um, and uh, came back. That wasn't enough. Went up the next year and I went to, up to Inga province because that was a lot rougher place. I wanted something rougher. Also went to the Garoka show. They have a Highland show. And I know guys have been there. I don't want to diminish it. I know you get the cool photos of you standing with the mud men and all that. But most people don't realize you're about a mile from a nice hotel with beer. So I can't stand that stuff. And that's what happens a lot in this new adventure world. Next year, I went over to the Indonesian side, and that was some world-class stuff. And one of those trips was it from Wamana in the interior all the way to the Asmat coast by myself using, not some company, by myself with locals that carried stuff. And we went down to the coast, and it was a bitch. It was a very, very hard trip, uh, very dangerous, um, and uh, made it to the coast. That, uh, you know, I didn't write anything about it. I write, tell people, everybody needs to know about that, but I did it, and it along with some other things. Um, there was something, and I did come back with some interesting perspectives from that. But going back, and this is important, and it's, I think it's worth taking a little time. At the time, and it's still this thing about contacting uncontacted tribes, and there's people, maybe some of you have done it, I hope not, but where you go to this place and then you come back and tell people, and I was the first white person they ever saw. Really? That, yeah, that says it on the brochure, that when you signed up for the thing. <laughs> that shit is out there. And, and, but what got me was I had a real epiphany experience because I was getting further and further out in that jungle in New Guinea. And there might be, there might be some places out in those swamps somewhere where there's uncontacted people because, goddamn, I was out there just from that little trip in some places. I don't know if anybody had been. No one didn't want to. It was a rough place. But I was coming off through a mountain once, coming down a mountain, and I saw this idyllic little village. And there was a guy out in front talking to all these people, had them around in a circle, and beautiful little fast huts. And I could see their gardens, and I could see what they had, you know, their little setup. And it looked just idyllic. And I thought to myself, I've got nothing to add to this. I've got nothing good to add to this. They're going to see me come through, look at my Rolex. Hey, maybe you want a Rolex? You want uh, my shoes? You want this stuff? I'm not saying, you know, it was paradise, but I saw more and more that this thing about wanting to find an uncontacted tribe, that's the last thing I'd want to do, expose them to this. Uh, why would I do that? Why would anybody want to do that? But they're still out there. They want to screw around with some person out in the Amazon. They get a photo of this, photo of this poor guy that's trying to stay hidden with his blowgun. And anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, but it's a tangent that's important to me I, I, because it's an it's a, it's, it's a issue I live in this historical house. I have these historical items. 
and I'm in a world that that stuff isn't all that appreciated anymore, and um, where what else is there to do? Say Mars. <laughs> all right, next. All right, that's a tirade. Speak of tourists. Here you go. You know who this is? This is Buzz Aldrin. Now, Buzz Aldrin actually came to the South Pole in 2000. It was 16, 17, right during that summer. So I don't know if it was after New Year's or not. But nonetheless, he came down on a, it was a foreign tour group. And um, immediately after getting to the pole, he was sick. And I explained a little more in the book. But um, notice him sitting there, see his glass of, uh, had a glass of water. He, um, he's an older guy. He, he claimed later, back up, please. Back up, no, that, yeah, right here. He claimed that he was the, they, he was the oldest. There's actually was an older guy at the pole. I think it was older than Buzz. Still, uh, he he got there. He had altitude sickness, and he had been sick prior. It turned out, probably shouldn't even been on the trip. But he's Buzz Aldrin, iconic individual. And I got to I got to spend a little time with him when he was in the clinic. I didn't want a picture with him because he had a tube in and stuff. And but he saw my Explorers Club hat. And he's, a, I think, the most prominent member of the Explorers Club, as far as I'm concerned. He's an iconic individual. And um, he's an and honorary member here as well. Yeah, he's a, he's a you know, you know he's, a, he's a just a, he's iconic. That's a fact. Um, next, please. Ice tunnels, the ice tunnels, they run under the station over 1,000 feet. They contain the freshwater lines. I won't go into that, freshwater, the sewage lines, and where they go. But they, um, they've also contained these shrines. People have these shrines, and most of the shrines, no one knows even what they are anymore. There's some Russian sturgeon. There's a, there's a uh, ice sculpture of the scream, you know, that scream thing. There's all these weird things in there. And ice, the, the South Pole is interesting from a uh, perspective of what people will do, you know, in isolation. Next. I, uh, I gave the... Uh, Oh, it was a Kleenex that Buzz had used. I found it on the ground afterwards, on the floor. I gave it to a couple of my science guys. They immediately had a case made for it, put the cup they thought he drank out of, and that was placed at the shrine in the ice tunnels. It's still there. <laughs> Next, take a look, and you can read that. Buzz Aldrin's tissue, <laughs> caution space germs. It's my thought. I love Buzz. I think we can clone him. 50,000 years from now, that fluid's preserved at minus 50 constantly. We can clone Buzz Aldrin some days, what I hope. All right, summertime's fantastic. Next. Okay, the day comes for winter overs when the big day, they want, we all want the, the summer people to leave. And they do, and there's 42 happy people waiting for that last aircraft to leave. And it is a big moment. Next. What do you do? Well, shortly after, you go to the gym, uh, uh, usually the weekend. Uh, it'll be a Saturday night after the last flight pulls out on, around February 15th, and you watch all three versions of The Thing. <laughs> the, the Thing. There's three. Now, I had years, you know, I, 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 made, I did the same thing every year. I, I would, uh, I would, uh, I like to do what the crew wanted to do, but I would kind of put my foot down with a number of things if I, I just thought it'd be better. Um, Talk I'm a little bit about leadership and what I wanted to accomplish. I knew even from the first winter before I'd, before I'd spent any time there that what I wanted to accomplish was I wanted that crew to do a great job and I wanted them to be proud, to be proud of the great gift they'd been given to be part of a South Pole winter crew. I wanted them and I wanted them to respect those that had gone before them. The uh, great explorers, um, um, explorers <coughs> Amundsen, Scott, Shackleton, and also the heroic Navy veterans from the 1950s and 40s even, and 60s that created those stations that they did down there. I wanted them to be proud. I wanted them to understand more about that. So history was a big thing with me. Um, and then I wanted them to come out of there as a group, you know, a cohesive group that would, um, you know, forever cherish that experience. I knew that. I knew I wanted those things. And so I, I used my force of personality, which is all you can do to kind of skew things a certain way. Other winter managers have other ideas. I'm not here to judge how they wanted to do it. It's just we're different. But that's what I wanted. Next. It starts getting dark. The sun starts going down. Next. Sun goes down. Next. Down. See the green flash on that one? Yeah. All like that. Next. Then it gets dark. Dark. Now, these photos are somewhat enhanced because they're photographic, so they catch a little more light than you'd see. Um, it wasn't quite that clear, although it's still pretty spectacular on a dark night with no moon. Next. Beautiful green auroras. 
the electromagnetic stuff that occurs for all you smart science people that know what causes that. Oh, I have it in the book. I had to look it up. Yeah, <laughs> the ele electromagnetic things that occur at the pole and all that. But it's the green auroras are, are cool, and um, I used them for walking. Next, satellite dome, the aurora. Next, uh, one of our stages. I think that's the arrow. Uh, their air research that, uh, that the, the NOAA, uh, National Oceanic Administration, runs. Very, very cool, uh, very cool uh, facility. Does great things. Next. Great photo. That's Dr. Jeffrey Chen. He's the one that took my, my cover photo. Uh, and he, uh, he gave me that thing. And that's, uh, it's, it's enhanced. The, the red is the camera's catching that somehow. The station, when you're outside, all you can use is red light. So it doesn't interfere with the Aurora cameras. So it's catching that, which you wouldn't see walking around out there. I'll show you what you'd really see. Next. OK. Now you know where you are when you see that with the stars. That, uh, that's, you can be two places, maybe the North Pole too, but you're at a pole when that happens. Next. OK, so cool stuff. Ooh, ah, great photos of uh, the South Pole winter skies and what happens. Food. I have a chapter on food, because food is, is to me, I think most Antarcticans will agree, even on the, in, in, for sure on the early expeditions, food was the number one, the number one desire uh, that, that any, those early explorers had. And even to this day, um, food looms large on the list of what a crew wants. Um, up in the left-hand corner, you'll see what I had done. That was for a midwinter dinner, and I wanted to do a historical thing. So there's pemmican, uh, there's hoosh. I had some hoosh made, which is a uh, sledging biscuits mixed with the pemmican. And then there were some fish that these Russians gave me that I wrote a short bit about uh, during one of the summers. And um, so people could taste what they had had that had gone before us. And, and the, they seemed to like this stuff, at least to try it. But they'll never know, we would never know, in the luxurious accommodations we had, what it felt like to be in a tent after a hard day of pulling, having this hot hoosh in a little plaster or a little metal cup, and it not really being enough, and eating that with a relish that you, you, in, you know, in our modern lives would never know. You see our food. Um, the, uh, the, that, that prime rib was from, it was probably from the Christmas dinner or maybe a Thanksgiving dinner that occurred during the summer. And the cake up top, if you've, any of you seen the special, the, the last, the, the, oh, what was it, Journey on Earth, it's a polar special um, that uh, is about six, seven, eight parts about Amundsen Scott race to the South Pole. The last place on Earth, wonderful, wonderful, can't recommend it enough, last place on Earth. Amundsen had a cake made like that, at least in the movie. And so I asked, uh, I got a picture shot from the movie and asked our cook if they could make it. And they did. It actually shows from the Ross Sea up. Next, please. But food is a big thing there. Winter traditions. OK, I showed the pole markers earlier. I'll explain a little bit more about that. This was a, this thing I used for fun. But basically what happens is the crew that's down there during the, that winter gets to make design and manufacture a pole marker that's going to be placed January 1st. They'll be gone because they're going to leave by no, in November. But their pole marker then will be placed at the pole when it moves its 33 feet on the following January 1st. How does it start? First, the concept is, is, is come up. Member will have a concept. And then the member will then, uh, it'll get voted on. And this was something that they uh, came, one of them or some of them came up with. It's a joke. Uh, me writing a polar bear breathing flames. It would have been too hard to make, although I did like it a lot. But <laughs> well, th this reminds me of another anecdote from the book where you asked a trick question as part of your like psyche val or interview process oh, about the pole. You well, asked them how excited they were to see polar bears. Well, it wasn't something we asked. It was something they'd bring up. And I'm glad you brought that up. And I, when we had some photos taken earlier, I wanted to do it with the polar bear over here because I let the cat out of the bag. But um, if anybody during the interview said their, their desire to go to the South Pole to see a polar bear, you had problems. You okay, had someone who had done no, no type of, they did no research. And I write a funny thing about at least one person and what happened with the pol pol polar bears. The polar bears are all northern hemispheres. No polar bears in the southern hemisphere. Anyway, you get the concept, and then you, just, then you vote. And then you also have to, can the machinists really make it? That's the other thing. The machinists are super highly skilled. Uh, and so. Can, can they actually make the thing would be next. But this is what happens next. Next, please. 
Okay, so there's a case down there. These used to all be outside, 33 feet a year, 33 feet apart years ago, and then someone stole one. Somebody came and they're still not sure who stole the one that they stole. And so they were all brought inside, and now they're in cases. And you can see from the very early ones, you're looking at just like a simple brass tube. And, and then as the years go, next, they get more and more sophisticated. They get to be some real works of art. Now, I tried to influence this at least a time or two and go back to something Retro, similar, you know, and there were actually some designs floated with a copper tube pipe again. We were going to go back to that, but we always ended up with um, beautiful designs and it just wasn't enough of the crew. And, then, and I, I concur it. Uh, next. Now, this is the 2017, and this is classic design. And in my book, I write about this. This is the one in the book that I was going to put the pebble that had came from Ernest Shackleton's grave. And thank God I didn't because when I found out later that, pedal, that pebble came off my from a Denver hiking trail. That <laughs> wasn't, wasn't the right pebble, thank God. But here's just an interesting thing about South Pole Cruise is that you have to watch what you say. And I learned several in instances where you had to watch what you'd say because they will take you up on it. And, and one of them had nothing to do with this, was at a meeting, and this is to talk about leadership. It's in the book. I, was at a, I had a guy come to my office, one of my crew members, and he says, Wayne, there's a reason you don't eat with us. And I didn't eat with them. I would go visit them when they're eating, but I'd eat alone. Uh, he says, the reason you don't eat with us is some kind of leadership thing. I says, no, it's I like to read. I like to, like to read, and I'm in my office and I read, and I only eat once a day here anyway. So uh, then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, you know, I don't want to be standoffish. I, I was there at every meal. I'd stop by, I'd talk to people. But nonetheless, something happened where when he mentioned that, it did, did make me think. So at the next all-hands meeting, I got up, and I said, uh, Okay, one of our crew members has asked if the reason I didn't don't eat with you guys where I don't actually sit down is, is it some kind of a leadership thing? And I, I said, it's not at all. It's I like to, I like to be alone. And, and if you want a goddamn candlelight dinner with Wayne, we can do that. Well, <laughs> within minutes, there was a sign-up roster for candlelight dinner with Wayne. <laughs> And a, t and a table with, and with a sign up and what the topics they want to discuss. And, and the table was set up with a candle and flowers. And I had candlelight dinner with Wayne on Saturday nights with the crew. And, and it, was, it, was, it was really a nice thing. And it was something where they, they enjoyed it. But I'm getting back to, see, you got to be careful what you say with these polies. Call each other polies. Because at, the, at one of the meetings prior to the poll, prior to the design for the pole marker, I got up and tried to give them basic guidance for the pole marker, what it had to meet. And I said, it has to be able to, that first the mechanic, our machinist can make it. And it has to meet certain you know, guidelines of, 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 uh, of good taste. It's got to go to the National Science Foundation, so it's got to be good taste. And you couldn't have something like a penis be your pole marker. <laughs> Next. So, <laughs> so they brought me this shortly after, and uh, I, uh, you know, so you have to be careful what you say to these guys, and I, and I write about what we ended up doing with that in the book, and I... Uh, Didn't you change the date on it to be well, the year told, after? Yeah, what I told them to do is, I don't know, I almost had Cal who made this thing here tonight, and I wish he'd have come, he could have got to explain it more, which I would have loved, his explanation. But it actually says South Pole Winter Crew 2020. And at some point, I knew it was there. And I thought, oh, God, we're leaving. We've got to do something with this thing. It, it wasn't the winner, by the way. It was a, but um, we've got to do something with this thing. So I told Cal, OK, Cal, you have two choices. Destroy it or change it to the 21 crew and give it to them. So <laughs> I don't know what he did. Next. OK. The Winter Crew photographs are important. I talk about it in the book because, because this is a chance for the per to be pictured for eternity at the South Pole, to be part of the crew. That is the crew photograph. And if you walk down that hallway, as I explain in the book, you'll see the crew photographs, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, you'll see the crew photographs that go back to these little black and whites, and, now, and they can become more and more and more sophisticated. In the book, I go into details about some years that had problems. And one way to tell if there's problems is if there's a bunch of not pictured people, they were making statements. Now, having a few not pictured, they didn't want to be in the picture, but their name is below, 
that's normal. There's people who don't like to be in photos, and you don't, you know, you don't force someone to be in a photo. And um, we had most all. We had all in a, you know, missing one, and then the other one, there was another story behind it, and then a full all of us below. But there's some years where there's problems, and I write about those problems. Crew photograph is a big deal. Next. That hallway, there it starts. And you see up in the upper left there, that's the first crew, the winner over 57. They have a dog. I think his name is Bravo. And there's several photographs after that time where there were dogs. And I wish we could have one now, but the Antarctic Treaty forbids it. Nonetheless, to me, that was a big deal, being photographed and being in that hallway forever. For as long as we have a station down there, it's a big deal. You're immortal once you're in there, once you're a South Pole winter crew member. You've been immortalized. And... Um, so, you know, I tried, you know, we, we wanted as many people as we could get, but having a, a, a this, those, those, those uh, winter crew photographs are a big deal. Next. Uh, celebration, the midwinter dinner, something I did in 2020. My love of history, I, I set this up. I did it in 2019 also. We pushed it a little more in 2020, although 2019 is when I had the, when I had the, um, uh, the snacks, the snacks and stuff. We didn't have those in 2020. Um, Nonetheless, see what we tried to do. And uh, that's Robert Falcon Scott at his uh, base at Cape Evans on the left. And that's our 2020 winter crew on the right-hand side. Just a magnificent group of people. Next. Outside. I was outside a lot. Next. Okay, that's my sign-out board, which is in the book. Um, I, people knew where I was. And there's different ways I would go. Neither in the station, they could contact me by radio if I wasn't in the office. I was on the science flag line. It's about a kilometer that runs out to the South Pole Telescope. And they, the radio doesn't work there, so they'd have to, I had a way they could turn a light on, and I'd see it if I needed to come back. And then I was grid south. That was where I was kind of on my own. And if I was out there, they could call me on the radio, all that would freeze up. And there's a funny statement about frozen pile in the spring. I knew that wouldn't happen. I didn't think it would happen, but um, what they would do. But um, some people will say, God, how could you do that? How irresponsible. But they, the guys knew where the, the, the equipment operators would know where to find me should, you know, God forbid something terrible have happened. But the fact of the matter is, in the end, I was for the almost three years I was there, I was out every day. I never missed a day and I walked 4,300 miles. So I was outside a lot and I practiced a lot and I could get back to the station and anything. And I was always very, very careful. Next. So in, another yeah. opportunity to interject here, especially touching on some of the distance that you put between yourself and the crew yeah. uh, that led to the, the candlelight dinners. Yeah. W one thing I'm curious about personally is, you know, you obviously have a, a huge reverence for Shackleton and Scott and Amundsen, these guys. And you talk in the book, I think it, it's, as you spent more time down there, that you started to spend more and more time alone. Yeah. And a lot of time outside in the elements. And I'm curious, was... Part of you doing that, you know, spending more time alone and, and being outside in the elements more and being away from the other people, was that part of feeling closer to those guys, your heroes? Was that distance necessary for you to feel that connection and bond with them? Well, Alex, that's an interesting statement. And I'd say in no way it was in my, my similarities. Those were great men that did great things on true expeditions that, you know, were going to the pole. However, they weren't there in the winter. And I, and I was there in the winter when the conditions were bad, even though I might only be a couple miles away. So tough comparisons, but I just found, you know, it was the strangest thing. It just was a great place to think out there, being alone like that. And then that whole essence of being, being alone and, and maybe being tied in more. I am with in my, when I'm with, in my house in, te in Texas with these things all around me from these great these great men from the past, you know, you all, it kind of starts flowing together after a while. So there is a part of it that, but it became kind of something bigger that I would never have known that I would have enjoyed that much, being, just being out there alone in that darkness. And uh, I really, really, you know, it was, there was nothing like it. When I left for my first winter, I remember a person that was leaving that was part of the Denver crew, the, the, you know, the a summer saying, get ready for the greatest adventure of your life. And I laughed. I said, this won't be the greatest adventure. Being killed in the Amazon, that was an adventure. Um, walking through, you know, the jungles of New Guinea, some of those places, that was a real adventure. I'm down here with, you know, food and in a warm place. But it did become an adventure in a different way, particularly as a station leader, to always have that pressure, to always being concerned about these people that, that, that were crew members. 
that to, you know, knowing that their welfare was much more important than my own, that was something that was big to me. Uh, and, and that distance really helped. It really helped. Um, but since we brought that up, one thing I would do too with them is I mentioned the distance and there was a distance, but I also made sure that they felt comfortable talking to me. And I know they did because they'd come and find me and they would stop me in the hallway. They'd want to talk about real personal things. My God, the things I learned about people. And I, and I don't put the stuff in the book. There were some unpleasant things that occurred with, with people. And I'll talk about a little bit more about later off ice and things that happened, family matters and things that were occurring, but I always wanted to be approachable. So I could, I, I did do both. And I would break, I would break, character sometimes and I would you know they're telling me some story I had a breakup between a couple and I wanted to talk to them so I'd tell them a funny story or something that occurred to me occurred with me earlier and and do that because I wanted to make sure I was at least I was approachable I didn't want to be this ice king distant thing distant from them well and especially you mentioned for context too that your last winter there was when COVID was starting to yeah to I'm, come into itself and I've got a I got a slide that'll show that and I'm glad you brought that up next All right, it's dark, that's cool. Next, but that's more what I saw. <laughs> All those beautiful things are great, but that's me walking with a headlamp, a red headlamp, and what I would have seen with some, from some ice crystals in the air. Next, that's minus 100. You can buy, I know that day, you know, I had number because of the frost around my eyes. That was a very cold day, and I'd been out for several hours. Next. Did the fluid in your eyes ever start to congeal or freeze? Um, what you'll see, can you back up please? Back up one slide. What you can't see from that is I had no, tr I had no luck with eye protection. There's people that wore goggles and things they could do that. I would freeze them up, I could never wear goggles. But what you see in that with that mask is what I would do is when I'm walking, as soon as I would hit the outside, I'd breathe. <sighs> I walked like, it was like scuba diving. <sighs> And it would freeze up. The water vapors would freeze up. That was ice. The whole front was ice. Well, see, that creates this void. And my breathing then is warm, and it's in there. And my and eyes... It's blowing up. And it blows up. Because I learned my first summer, because my eyes froze shut a couple of times. And I, I well, I've heard about that happening in, like, Chicago. Yeah, it so can happen. Curious, like, it can yeah. happen. It's yeah. really weird. The first time it happens, you're like, God damn, my eyes are frozen shut. But, um, um, you know, you learn those things. And then this is minus 100, and I wore no eye protection. But I had that void space breathing into it that kept my face warm. You had to be careful. But you can see there... You see it more in the next photo. Next, please. I'm wearing a bandage between my nose here because this used to always burn. You know, it, was, uh, it would frost, frostbite right through here. That was a one part. So I put a bandage, and that seemed to help. That's taken at minus 88. It was much warmer. And I exhaled on purpose to catch the exhale. I'm wearing the wolf skins. Next. Okay. That's my favorite photo. Um, it's interesting. Uh, that, I only found that photo a couple months ago. It was on a, a blog of, of Dr. Nathan Precup, who was um, just a fine young fellow um, uh, that, that would work one of our science experiments. And he took that and he had that on his blog and it said, this is our station manager out for his five mile walk or something like that. Uh, it's out in a storm, but that's my favorite photo. Interestingly enough, you, know, you write a book, you read my book, you know, I don't know what people will think of me. Um, you know, I mentioned my own ego and things like that. It's something that's always been out of control. It's been something that you check as best you can. Uh, um, and I, I'm very aware of it. And I, uh, and I, uh, I take at least, you know, try to hide it. But um, I did notice something and I was very happy to see is someone mentioned that in my book, there's no pictures of me. There's no pictures of my face in there. And I was happy that I didn't care, that I'd never even seen it. Um, it's, you know, it's a... Uh, being a leader in such a situation, there's nothing more important than that crew. And you've got to kind of develop that mindset that the crew comes first, that you come second. I've done many things in life and certainly have an ego from being a Marine all through other things in life. And it's something that you just got to really work to quench a little bit, particularly when you're a leader. Next. I was having some fun that day. It was about a mile and a half from the station. It was pretty cold, minus 98. Next. To show you what I wore, three different suits. This was kind of a modern, that's a generation three military, um, which worked well. That was good to minus 100 and plus, uh, more. Next. This was traditional I could wear in the summers. That's an Amundsen 
what he wore at the South Pole in 1911, and uh, a Shackleton sweater from the Shackleton Company. And um, that was good to about minus 55 or so in the summer is fine. Next. The next are the wolf skins. The wolf skins I wrote, I write about because of something I did in my second winter and then carried through the third winter. I wanted to do something. I wanted to wear something traditional. There's a famous photo of Roll Amundsen wearing wolf skins. And I debated it. I don't like, you know, I don't like this wolf fur, you know, to walk around Aspen, Colorado with a bunch of little minks you killed or something like that. I'm not a fan of that stuff. But I researched it, and I researched what was happening in Russia at the time with the wolves. And there's some very r rough articles about these wolves coming into villages and doing what they were doing. And, and, and there was enough of them. They weren't in danger or anything. So I had no problem having these made in Russia uh, several years ago. And um, now as I write in the book, I ask no pardon from any earthly anything, but I do from the spirit of those wolves the great spirit of those wolves, which I felt wearing it. And what I think you write it was too warm during the summer. It was. It wasn't summer wear. It was something you needed for the, for, I could wear it. I, a hundred, I, once I remember it was, it was what, day 104, 105, right in there. And I started off at a run and I started getting warm. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. I mean, they, they protect wolves, you know? So, yeah. so, so but they're, they're, it's, they're wonderful things. And I, and I, I feel strongly about it. It might seem kind of you know, funny that he's saying this about furs and he's wearing them, but I had, I've been contacted since then, and I had some Facebook guys contact me and says, we're going on an expedition on the... And it's like, first off, expedition was a, a, a real loose term. Somewhere on the coast, uh, probably getting off you know, the cruise ship and walking around or something. But, um, and he wanted to get a whole set of these for his crew, his team. And I said, no way, no goddamn way I was going to tell them how to do that so they could wear wolf skins in 30 degree weather around McMurdo or, or Palmer Station or wherever they were going to be. And I, and I you know, it's, 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 uh, it's bad enough. I, I, I feel okay about that, but, I, um, you know, if you don't need to wear that stuff. Okay, next. Activities, have a lot of activities. Starts with movies. The Shining, midwinter. You're down there, midwinter. You can't get out. Midwinter's June 22nd, June 21st. Crazy time. You're locked in. There's nowhere to go. You're going to murder people in an old hotel, like in The Shining. So we would show The Shining. That was always a big hit. But you show that one like halfway through the trip, too, right? Yeah, well, that's that it. It's halfway <laughs> yeah. through. So right in the middle. Once people winter, are really starting to get stir crazy. Getting, you've already got the guys that are going kind of crazy. You know them. So, you know, you keep the, the sharp utensils away from them and yeah. such. And, 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 and maybe you don't let them go see The Shining. <laughs> so they yeah, get yeah. ideas. There's fire axes and stuff in there. So you have to be careful. Anyway, a lot of cool midwinter activities that you do. Uh, next. Activities every night we had activities, and I really I think all winter crews do that. All winter crews do activities, and and there's all kinds of talks and things, and um, groups that put on things and sporting events. And I think a real successful winter will have a lot of activities, Just keep people busy and have some fun stuff to do. Next, I had adventure movie night with Wayne. That photo was taken in New Guinea, crossing the mountains years ago in Erie and Jaya. That was called back then, and then I was showing the movie South. 7, 8, 7 p.m. Is um, that the original documentary yeah, that was it's, filmed? Yeah, it's original. It's really cool, black and white. And what I tried to do is it was big for me to, to share history with my crews. So even the third winter, even better, I would bring things from my collection, and I'd get up and talk, talk about the things. And I had some very knowledgeable people that were in my, in my groups that would come, to the, would come to the talks, and they could talk too. We could have a little discussion afterwards, and you know, then they'd go get drunk or whatever afterwards, Saturday night. But it was a nice alternative, and I, had, I usually had... Next. Let's get into winter issues. I go into it more in the book. I'm not going to go into too much. There's embarrassing stuff that people, you know, things happen. Um, this, there's a term at the South Pole called being toasty. You'll hear them. Toasty, toasty. Toasty, actually, you know, I think there's a, what do they call it? A, oh, there's a term, T3 or something, syndrome. There's still a lot of research out on what happens over a South Pole winter or any time you're in isolation somewhere. Um, maybe the lack of some kind of enzyme builds up, but, but I, but I saw that whether, whatever caused it, I saw the, the manifestation of it with people who were changing attitudes. You know, they would get kind of really, we all got kind of unkempt, longer hair. Some guys, a lot of the men wore beards, uh, but then you'd see these strange attitudes. You'd see anger flash up, uh, really, really quickly. Um, um, people would have, uh, um, 
just start acting out of character. Uh, all, and, and so you had to be consciously aware. And I write in the book about a situation where two very educated gentlemen, one was a scientist and one was a science assistant, very, very educated. They came down, faced each other in a hallway, and they got in a terrible argument. And then they came right to my office. Came to my office to tell me what happened. They got in a terrible argument, and um, terrible words were exchanged. And it had to do with the fact that one of them stopped the other one and claimed that two weeks earlier, during the pole Olympics that we had, the pole Olympics, that other fellow had cheated on the treadmill thing, and that cost him the bronze medal. The shop made, little thing made in the shop, the bronze medal. And that was, and, and when he came in to tell me, I almost started laughing. It's like, this is a little thing made from a bolt on a piece of ribbon? You're gonna fight in the hallway over this. But that's the stuff that happens. Passions yeah. get inflamed, and the, you know, um, so there, there's a number of winter issues, and as people are more you know, in, in isolation, I saw, I saw a breakdown with people. A guy ruined a very expensive part in our vehicle maintenance facility. He, couldn't, um, he just wasn't thinking correctly, used the wrong tool. It was a very expensive part, and it caused some problems. But he, he, he just was, his mind wasn't right at that point. So it does happen. You gotta be, and as a leader, you've got to be constantly looking for it. Next. And then they get some weird things where people start thinking about things to do. And, and they, the first year I was there, they really fixated on my mustache uh, for some reason. And um, I bring this up because they'll fixate on things. And they'll, you'll start to see, you know, these, these, these things that will occur. So my mustache became this point. And so I saw this one day posted, and I, I had to get a copy of it. It was just kind of cool. But um, then it started. Then there were other things. And then next. So... Then they, uh, the guys put in the galley floor my mustache symbol into the galley floor. And so at an all-hands meeting, I did this ceremony. Next. And I, there it is in the galley floor. So, um, but there was more to that and some things I didn't put in the book. So they, so the mustache and then these other things occurred. And I saw a big, you know, other things with the mustache and, and uh, you know, I was the king of myself, which I thought was pretty cool. But um, uh, then, at the end of this winter, when my boss showed up, I went out to greet him at the plane. And when I came back to the station, they had this big banner of the mustache over the damn observation deck. So the first thing he sees is the banner of the mustache. And then he goes into the station. And I had never seen this before, and it's not in the book. But on the walls of the station, was the Book of Wayne. Yeah, yeah, no, let me say, uh, this was written by a very, very, very interesting scientist. Stuck on the walls were this book so that the new crew that just were leaving us could see what we did that winter with this big banner of the mustache hanging, flying over the station, and the Book of Wayne prominently posted everywhere. In fact, the complete copy was in my boss's room, so he could read it later, which he did, and then wanted to talk to me about it. He probably thought you were starting some kind of religion Holy down there. shit, I thought I was, I was headed to the psychologist after that, but he, you know, such gems as this. For then Wayne rose up in great and righteous anger and struck the sun from the sky, declaring, let six months of darkness fall upon all the land. <laughs> and Wayne did stretch out a mighty hand and painted the sky itself with dancing fire of green and purple. For it is not written, those who expose themselves fully to the true harshness of the continent shall have glory everlasting in the club of 300. That's a 300 club, which I would explain. Anyway, it went on and on. Um, has Wayne not returned us to the light? And has he not made the light last for all times, unlike the light of lesser places, which comes and goes so quickly? Truly, brothers and sisters, his mercy is exceeded only by the glory of his mustache. Okay, so that was just good fun. But I have to say, you know, the crew coming in probably thought, boy, this must have been a creepy Did, did you have to have like a, a <laughs> semi-serious conversation about that with your boss? Just yeah, to... <laughs> he, you know, he's like, what did you Like guys... this is a joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and the guy that wrote it said, thought I was a good sport about that because I didn't know they were going to do that. Yeah. But anyway, that, um, it was funny. But that's, I'm talking about the kind of things that a South Pole winter crew will fixate on and do. Next. Crisis. All right. There's many types of way, crisis people can have. I use some of mine. I mean, it was a little careful. Other people, we had people at deaths in the family. We had a person who had a bunch of money stolen once, a uh, very unfortunate event. We had um, other things, personal crisis that, that occurred off, uh, off the ice. And that's something that 
if you've ever been in a remote site, particularly with no way to get out, a crisis can be the smallest thing. You know, there might be, a, you know, well, not small, you know, a child is sick, a pet gets lost, a pet dies, their parents die, all these things can happen. So I spoke a couple of the crises that I had, and as a leader, it was a little rough. I, in 2017, live in Gulf Coast, Texas, Rockport, Texas, little house on the Gulf Coast. And I watch the hurricanes. I'm watching them now. You see what happens. My house was built in 1868. It's a great old place. It's filled, looks like this place. It really does. The point is, from out in the Gulf, I see a little thing that's going to form into a hurricane. It's 2017. And it starts going toward Texas. And as most hurricanes do, a lot of them will diminish or they'll change, you know, direction somewhat or whatever. And I'm following it, following it, following it. And damned if on, um, then it's, it's an imminent strike in October, on August 25th, 2017, Hurricane Harvey came ashore at Rockport, Texas as a category four hurricane, 130 miles, actually a little more mile per hour winds hit my little town and my house is right on the water. Uh, my wife had evacuated to, uh, to um, inland in San Antonio, but for two days, I didn't know if I still had a house. I'm the leader. Now, what do I do? Do I cry and wail and tell people, oh my God, my house is gone? I didn't, didn't tell anybody. No one needs to know anything about that. But I'll tell you what, if you think I wasn't concerned, mostly concerned because I have 20 cats and she couldn't evacuate those cats and that was my biggest concern. But she only got two of them out of there. Point is, that's the kind of stuff that you might face. And anybody that has a place in Gulf Coast, Texas could be facing that same thing. So two days later, I find next. My house is still there. Fortunately, I had, they didn't board it, but I had, uh, I did have working shutters. I lost my roof shingles. I lost fences. I lost the top of my uh, chimney. Next. Okay. Actually, there was another slide. That used to be, oh, well. Yeah. It, you could see. It was just, uh, and I got away lucky. There's people that had water. We at least didn't have water. The town was really, really hurt. And it took you know, me days to even know that the house was still there. My wife and my cats were all fine. That was a big thing. The cats were all fine. But that's the kind of thing you'll face. And there's no way to come back. It is August. And I know I'm not getting out till November. 2020, what happens? You guys all lived it. Next. COVID. And I write a little bit about the start of it. With the South Pole, we kind of know it. We hear about it. We're reading about it. And this thing is getting worse and worse. And, you know, I know we got the people out there are going to go, oh, it's just the flu. It wasn't really all that bad. And their death statistics. No, nah, it was bad. Stuff was happening. And when you're at the South Pole and you've got loved ones that catch this or you've got someone that died from it or someone, whatever the hell, it created a real atmosphere of uncertainty for us at the South Pole to the point where we weren't even sure, and, I'm, and I make a, a point of this in the book, there was a strange night when this thing was really raging. It was in the middle of our summer down there, June, July, and we started thinking about, I, uh, with uh, some background in uh, epidemiology, was concerned about a mutation, if it would mutate toward the worst. And I've still understood later that it doesn't, usually a mutation is lesser. I don't know, but I don't know that. I don't know that. And then anyway, a mutation that would be worse, even worse, and if that happened, would they come to get us? We are not on anybody's real radar into the world scenario. So one night in the galley, we start talking about what we're going to do to get out of there if, we, if they don't come to get us. And as it was, they were almost a month, three weeks, over three weeks late to getting us, and they didn't fly the C-130s. They had to come in with the, the DC-3, the Basslers. So that's the kind of stuff that that 2020 crew faced that the, the, the 17 and 19 didn't face. And... and um, it wasn't easy being at the South Pole. And people, sometimes I got a phone call once and they said, oh, you're so lucky. I was in a meeting to be down there. No, I'm not. I don't know. How's my wife doing? How am I, you know, anybody I know? How are the crew members doing? And I can't do anything. I'm stuck down here. It was, it was hellish at times. Next, please. The end of winter. Finally, the winter, the sun comes back up. And this is a great time. You're tired. You want to see the sun. Next. And the first thing you see is, you know, it's beautiful. That's Danny Hampton. Danny Hampton um, was one of our, it was a steward. He did, had one of the, it's a, not a, it a, can be a thankless job, but he, um, a wonderful young man who uh, um, took fantastic photos and videos. And there's a couple of videos he shot for me for the Explorers Club. Next. That's the cover of my book, shot by Dr. Jeffrey Chen after a seven mile walk, minus 104, on September 11th, 2000. 20. Next. 
the view after a winter, the place is piles and piles, tons and tons and tons of ice crystals have blown behind the station. It all has to be cleaned out. There's a tank underneath all of that. It has to be cleaned out. Next. More ice. Next. Getting the airfield ready, the land plane. You got the first thing you want to do is get that ski way ready. They land on skis out there so the flight can come in. And I had these heavy equipment operators that were superb. I had two of them. One guy did two years, and then, then a third one came in. They were all absolutely superb, superb heavy equipment operators. Didn't need me to do anything. They, they took care of it. Next. Flight comes in. It's funny when that first flight comes in and you see these new people, and I write about that, some psychological things of sitting in a room with new people and wishing they weren't there, and it's really weird. Um, strange dynamics. Next. There's the Basler. That's the DC-3, the Ken Bork Aviation. It's a 1940s airframe, beautiful thing, a beautiful aircraft. Uh, still the, you know, the old airframe along with new electronics. Next. That's more or less what they jumped out of on D-Day, right? Yeah, I think so. Is that the, is that? C-47. C-47. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice to know it's still, uh, <laughs> it's still flies. in Antarctica. Yeah, I mean, that's a workhorse. It's a beautiful aircraft, it really is. Next. Okay, these are the, these are the winter over medals that every, every winter over gets. These, this is mine. Um, it's a very proud thing. I got the... Uh, this is the standard Antarctic Service Medal, which you get, I think, from doing about anything down there in McMurdo or, or uh, um, the South Pole. Even during summer, I believe you're supposed to get one. But the winter over clasp that you see in the, that you see in the photograph, um, uh, it comes in three grades, bronze for one year, gold for two, and silver for three. And so I got the uh, silver on here for three years as the winter manager at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Now that has a very, very minor historical significance in that, in that um, I think I'm, I'm going to mention, but it's a hard job. In 65 years that the Pole's been there, they've been, there's been that many, that many winter managers, and only two others have done two years. The rest are one and done, so there's a reason. It's not an easy job, so I'm the first one to do three. Now, put that in perspective, the record for South Pole winters is like 15. It was done by a uh, German, one of our German physicists, and followed by another guy who did 14, which I, I think I mentioned earlier. He died. But, um, but they have a different situation when they come in as, that, you know, as a scientist than what I had. And I'm very proud you know, that I got that. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I'm not, you know, in, the, in, in general, I'm not really into honors type thing, but it's something that I, that I earned, and uh, it makes it very real. Um, another thing that means a lot to me, there's little trinkets. This is a ring. This ring was made by Hal, or, or, our, um, Cal, our, uh, our Cal Nesky, our last um, machinist. And it actually has winter site manager. It has a number. My number is 1522. Um, only about 1,600 people now have wintered to the South Pole. We all have numbers. And so that's my number. And um, it means a lot to be part of that, be part of that. And I, what matters more is I hope my crews, I hope my crews feel that way, that it meant a lot to be there. And the great honor it was to be there and to follow all those great men and women that went before us. Next, please. My boss, at our, at the, it's a wonderful ceremony, um, getting that Antarctic Service Medal. I, I loved handing, when the, my crew members would get that. Next. And the flight leaves. I actually left on a Basler, the last flight, but generally you get out on a 130. Next. Okay, it's the end. Now, let me say a couple things about the book. That, that, was a, that wasn't too bad. Um, it was actually shorter than, yeah, uh, I think the last time. But if anybody's interested in the book, I didn't bring any to sell. You get it on Amazon. Um, anybody that's bought it, I want to tell you I appreciate it. Uh, you know. I'm, a, I'm an adequate writer, I'd just say adequate, but I tell a story that really hasn't been told, at least from the perspective of the winner leader, and I, I think I tell a good story. If uh, anybody buys that book and wants it autographed, um, you, can, you can contact, look, I've got some cards, I can give you a card. We could always mail it back or do something like that, but um, I, again, I appreciate anybody buying my book. It's interesting being an author, the thing about it that, that, that I, that I kind of get out of it is, I have a responsibility. You're buying something. You're buying a product. Before, I just got up here and got to tell cool shit. That's real fun. You know, there's nothing really in it. But someone buys my book. They spent money on that, and they deserve to, you know, uh, 
um, you know, I deserve, I would hope that they deserve to have a good product. And I hope it is that. And if you do do that, please, a review like on Amazon is, is, a, is a good thing. I would appreciate that. Um, and yeah, like it goes up and down. There's a, they have these little categories they do now. It goes in and out, but it's in Arctic ecosystems and stuff. I, it's uh, it's actually, it, that's that's they do that for marketing. But thanks, Jeff, for that. It, I do like it when I see that little banner. It pops up and down. It goes up. It depends. If you buy a few books, it uh, it'll go back down. But um, it was a just to end my my discussion here before. If you guys think, uh, to me, it was truly the greatest honor of my life being involved at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station and having those crews and nothing meant more to me than those crews and I still am in contact with a number of people and, and hopefully always will be. Uh, it, it's a special relationship and uh, I was blessed to, to be able to do that. So thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Oh, Wayne, thank you. It, it is a fantastic product. The book title again is Cold. So not, you know, Hard to forget. <laughs> um, and if we have time, let's do just a couple quick questions from the audience, and then hopefully, Wayne, if, if you're able to stay a little oh, bit sure, after, I'll be around. Anybody else sign or something? Yeah, I know people well, are let's, late. Let's do a couple, and then, uh, yeah, we'll get into it. Yeah. I hear you. I understand the facility is U.S. government own property. I'd like to know what is the mission statement of that facility. Yeah. The people that come there to use it, I assume, are primarily scientists from yeah. all places all over the world with product uh, projects. How is the, pro the whole facility funded? Yeah. And where does the money come from to, to keep the whole thing going? That's a really great question, because I didn't cover that. The National Science Foundation, NSF, actually administers that uh, through the U.S. Antarctic program. And then as I was involved with the Antarctic support contract, the contract side, I worked for contractors. I was an employee of when I first went down there. Um, um, let's see. It was uh, Lockheed Martin, and then later it was Lidos. Uh, but there's a number of government employees, and the funding is from the National Science Foundation. The mission, found, the mission statement, which there is one, and I can't quote it, but it's, it's science. Uh, no one owns Antarctica. That's what us as signatories of the Antarctic Treaty will uh, all agree on, that no one owns Antarctica. Now, there are some South American countries that try to say they own certain sections, but as of now, we say it's all sort of a laboratory. It's fragile environment. We need to protect it. And the National Science Foundation is re responsible for the funding and all that. And I would say this. I've been a defense contractor for many years, and it was a pleasure working with the National Science Foundation. I've had some very, very difficult contracts with the U.S. government, with the military, and my experience with the National Science Foundation was a little more positive, a little more collegial, how we work together. But that's where the funding comes from, and it is primarily science. Yes. Uh, Sue, one more. Um, I have, I've heard a lot in the last several years regarding the ice melt in yeah. Antarctica. And uh, from your perspective, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'd just say I'm not really very qualified to answer something like that as you start getting into the climate change and all that. However, I'll say this. What we do know is it is it's calving off. There's huge there's huge amounts of these glaciers, these Antarctic glaciers. They're into the water, you know, uh, and, and, and you can see that. Um, uh, it's interesting because South Pole had the coldest season in many years, I think, last year. So, you know, you start talking about this, but we do know we're losing ice. We know that. We're losing it on the coastal side, and they're worried about these big pieces that can fall off and actually, you know, can, can raise ocean levels and such. But it's not, it's not my area of expertise. It's something I know we're watching very closely. Right, Before you go, can I ask Wayne something about Mars? Can, can you yeah. tell us 30 seconds about are we going to get human DNA, DNA reproducing on Mars? Is Elon Musk too old to go, and, and will it be American or Chinese DNA? Here's the deal. I think I mentioned that I'm, I'm going to go to the Mars Convention. I'll be the odd man out. There'll be a bunch of science people talking about robotics and all this, and here's something like me up there talking about wearing wolf skins at the South Pole. Um, so, so I think I'll at least make it entertaining, because I can at least give stories of people in isolation, and that's really the way I'm going to go. I'm going to talk about that, because that's what I know. Um, 
I hope so. I really hope so. I think that's our, our, our and, and those rich guys, if they want to send me a one-way trip, Elon, what's that other guy's name, Bozos or something? <laughs> Whatever his name is, I'm there, buddy. I'm there. One-way trip. One way, the only logistic way to really do it, like eating the dogs? Well, yeah. And, you know, the only thing was, I mentioned that at a, at a get, get with my wife, and she was nodding her head like, well, wait a minute. I was, don't, don't nod your head so vigorously about me making the one-way trip. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, what an honor that'd be. Who would go? Let me ask this. Who'd go to Mars in here on a one-way trip? I'm, I'm okay. still pretty young. Okay, yeah. That's a long See, time. See, <laughs> there's a difference, too. Yeah. Being my age, what do I really have? So, you know, there's a deal. But that's a great one. Mars is the big thing. And, I, you know, I get down on, I get down on some of the things that I call stunts, expedition-type things that, that people do today. And, and, you know, maybe I take that too much. I don't know. But I'm... But, Damn, I would love to in my lifetime see us on Mars. I really hope we do that. I think I'm a, a kid that grew up in the Apollo mission, which a number of you did too. You remember those days. And uh, one quick story. I know it's late, but this is this about that because it's it's important and it, it could be controversial. In one of the years, I think it was 19, we made contact with the ISS, the International Space Station. It's floating around there. You can see it. And we had a person on there, an astronaut that actually had wet, wintered at the South Pole before. And I didn't go to it. We had to get together. I set up a computer. I had a screen. They were all going to do this. And I went out for a walk. I just went out. out. And when I came back, one of my scientists came up to me and said, we were shocked you weren't there. We were shocked you weren't there um, with your love for the exploration. He said something about astronauts. And I said, I wasn't there because there weren't any astronauts here. Buzz Aldrin's an astronaut. Is that ISS? I can see it up there. I walked farther than that last weekend. Now, before everybody screams, cries, whatever the hell, of course they're astronauts. Of course they are. And of course, to get to a position to be in that International Space Station, it's a big deal. They'd be cream of the crop, you know, people, and they're doing important things. But what I'm seeing is a guy floats in space with a little clipboard and a pen, and he's talking to Andrew Jackson Elementary School. I don't care about the pen floating in space from that far up that I can see. Because I remember what it was like being at a swimming pool in 1969 when the Eagle landed on the, on the moon. And, and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin got out of that thing. You know, that was the real deal. We had national will and we did something. The ISS, and don't get me started on the space shuttle, a high-flying airplane, you know, a cool piece of technology, no doubt about it. But it took us off what I hope would be our path to Mars and then to the stars. Okay. And, and one last real quick question. Sorry, one, but just to bring it back to Antarctica. Um, you had mentioned at the end of the book that after each winter over, you got to keep a flag. There was a yeah. flag raffle, and you kept some sentimental yeah. flags uh, that connected to your historic heroes. You got a Norwegian flag yeah. that you went to. I forget the museum's name, but Fromm essentially in an, an Amundsen yep. Museum. In Oslo, yeah. Uh, you had the British flag, and you went yep. to the Discovery yep. Falcon Scots uh, yep. Museum. And you mentioned it, it kind of uh, abstractly that you, you finally, on your last trip, took home an American flag, I which is American usually flag, yeah. the tradition for the winter yeah. site manager. Yeah and that you had a location in mind yeah. for a journey you're going to take with that. Yeah. Is there any chance you could disclose where you were yeah, planning yeah. to Yeah, yeah. The that? thing was with the COVID and all that, the traveling, I kind of put that off. But there's two places. Because we don't have, this British still have their great ship, Discovery, Scott's ship up in the Dundee shipyard. They have a great museum. The Fromm Museum in Oslo is, is for Amundsen, is, and I might be going there in December again. I've been there. I took the flags there. We got great photos at both those locations. Americans, we don't have like the you know Roosevelt ship, I don't think. But what we do have is, I think his aircraft is up at some museum that Ford Tri Motor, where they call that, I think in Dearborn, Michigan. So I'm going to contact them. And also Gus Shin's, that thing he landed at the South Pole in 1956 is down in a in a place in was Florida. That, was that with Bird? <laughs> it was after Bird. Okay. Bird landed, did his thing, but at the South Pole, Bird I think flew over it. But Gus Shin who's still alive, who is still alive, 100 years old, I believe now, landed at something Skytrain at the South Pole in 1956, I believe. And there was a museum, an Air Force museum in Florida that has that aircraft. That's, I just wanted to kind of wait till this whole COVID thing's done, and then I'll take those flags here and get some photo of that American flag. But thanks for that question. Well, that'll be fantastic. Well, Wayne, thank you again for coming out and speaking to us. Again, the book's name is Cold. I hope everybody uh, who's interested has a chance to check it out. It's a fantastic read. Wayne, as always, it's always great to have you here. I hope you'll come back and, and visit us again soon. 
And uh, for everybody tuning in at home, I hope you continue to check in on what the Adventures Club is up to. We have programs every single Thursday on all kinds of stories from off the beaten path. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.